Today, we're going to be talking again about the power of mortality credits, and we're going to get into a specific example. I hope you enjoy. Before we get too deep into this, since we are going to be talking about money, earning, and what have you, I need to go ahead and, in full disclosure, let you know this is not advice. It's not considered to be advice. I know nothing about your specific situation. This video is purely for educational purposes. So let's get started. So the other a uh, couple of weeks ago, we had a very well received video on mortality credits and calling them super juice. But we were talking generally. So today I want to get into a specific scenario to show you exactly what that can do and what that can look like. And again, as I've done in the past, we're going to be using uh, Truth Concepts, which is a wonderful software program. And it's going to help us run some quick numbers. So if we begin with the end in mind and we want to incorporate mortality credits versus just strictly being in a investment only position when we get to the retirement point or to the end, we have to start that in the beginning. So we're going to use a person A and person B, and I'm going to use some, some of the same numbers I used last time. So if you see both videos, it'll probably begin to come together for you. So we're going to look at a 30-year time horizon. Present value, we're starting at zero. This individual's saving $20,000, and they're just going to use common strategies, current strategies, which are going to be I'm going to put the money in some kind of market type of vehicle. Now, we're going to assume an 8% return, and it doesn't matter what the rate of return is. It's all going to ultimately create the same outcome, not the same amount of dollars, but as far as you being in a stronger position when you incorporate mortality credits, regardless of what your rate of return was. So we're going to use an 8% rate of return, a total all-in cost of 1.5%. And we can see if that individual saved $20,000 a year, earning that return for 30 years. Well, something's not coming up. There we go. Then they would have basically $1.8 million in an account. Now, we're not getting involved in tax conversations or anything. That would simply muddy the waters. I want to look at one specific piece, but just know those are also going to come into play and either help or hurt your position. So that's person A. Person B elects to incorporate mortality credits. So they set up two accounts. One is the account, just like person A, but they're going to put $11,000 a year in it. Whoop, let me back that up. I'm going to put 11000 If I could punch the right number. Earning 8%. So the only variable here is we changed how much was going into that account. And you can see we end up with $990,000. So on first blush, a person would assume, well, that individual, person B, is not going to have as much income as person A. The extra piece that we're incorporating in here is person B position at $9,000, that additional $9,000, in a properly structured life insurance contract. Now, you may be thinking, well, why in the world would they do that? For a number of reasons. It now introduces mortality credits into the equation. It creates a separate account that's not impacted by the ups and downs of the market returns that the investment account is. But again, when you look at that, you think, well, okay, that individual is going to be, person B is going to be far worse off than person A. Well, maybe not. So let's jump over here to this camera. So we've got two, the two people here, and I went ahead and plugged the numbers in for so that we could be expeditious. We got person A that has $1.8 million, and we got person B that has 990000 in one bucket, 526000 projected in a, the life insurance bucket, and that life insurance bucket has a $1 million death benefit connected to it. 
So if we now look at they're ready to retire, person A can take a distribution and all the empirical evidence tells us from all the research, academic research that's being done, a 3% distribution rate is a rate you can pull out of an investment account and have a reasonable expectation that that account would last 30 years. Doesn't mean you still have the 1.8 million there. We don't know what it would have, but you could have a reasonable expectation you would not run out of money for 30 years. So if you took 3%, that would be a $54,000 distribution that you could pull out of that $1.8 million. On the other hand, person B, because they now have a permission slip and the permission slip says, I don't have to worry about this account running out of money. I've got a backup, which is here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a private pension. And because we're creating a private pension and we're now introducing mortality credits, I can set up contractual income or promise-based income to the tune of $75,000. And that contractual or promise-based income says that they will guarantee me that $75,000 will come in for the rest of my life, no matter how long I live. Now, sometimes people will look at that and say, but wait a second, if you do that, then you pass away, then this bucket is gone. And that's correct. That's exactly what would happen. This was part one of the mortality credit. But if I do that and I set this up, I, the only reason I'm able to do that is because I'm sitting on this $1 million death benefit over here. Because the moment my heart stops beating and this bucket comes to an end, it gets refilled with a $1 million of actually income tax-free money. So because I had the mortality credits that come with life insurance and with a private pension, now all of a sudden I've opened up a whole nother plethora of opportunities that I don't have if I'm person A and all I have is an investment account. Another piece that comes into play is if this account is producing dividends, if it's properly structured and it's producing dividends, I can also draw dividends off of this to supplement my income. And in this particular example, based on current performance, this could potentially produce another $15,000 of what currently under current tax law is tax-free income. So now this individual is drawing, between the two of these, they're drawing $90,000. And the important thing to understand is person A and person B both put the same amount of money back. Neither one of them put more than the other. The question is, where did they put the dollars and how did they organize them? Because there's a sweet spot here in between where you want each one to go. It's not just a willy-nilly, well, I'll throw some here and throw some there. Again, this is not intended to be an investment advice. Advice that you get should be based on your specific situation. This is purely for educational purposes. If you, if you look at this and say, wow, you know, I'd like to see how that potentially would impact my situation, then please don't hesitate to give us a call here at Westside Advisors and Insurance Services. I hope you have a great week.